Yeah. Okay, so I think we, we can begin now. People who still have coffee will miss the first minute. So please, I will ask you uh, to uh, welcome our first speaker. who will talk about the UK banking API journey. Please have a warm welcome for him. Thank you. Thank you. So, it's okay here. Slides are up. Ah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for coming and listening to me. Um, I do apologize, first of all, if you heard me talk yesterday at the Open Banking Expo. You might as well go, because I'm going to say exactly the same thing I said yesterday. Um, but no, please, seriously, please stay. Um, so my, my name is Chris Michael. I've been leading the development of the Open Banking Standard in the UK. I also run a, a fintech called Ozone that uh, provides API technology for banks to comply and compete in, in this space. So what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is the, the journey that we've been on. Um, we are two months past the RTS deadline. Um, I'm going to assume you all know what PSD2 and RTS is all about. I'm, uh, um, so. Um, apologies if, if, uh, if I have to pitch this at a certain level of uh, assumption about understanding here. Um, so we're, you know, we're two months down the road. I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are, a bit, a bit more detail about what is the status of open banking in the UK, looking at some of the APIs that are out there, what's the performance like, conformance, which is a hot topic certainly for me. Um, and then we're going to drill down a little bit more into what, what the consent and authentication journeys are looking like. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, example use cases and from my perspective, what I think are the interesting use cases that are not just there now, but that are really uh, starting to, we're starting to see. And then talk a little bit about what's next. What's next for the standard? What is open banking uh, really going to achieve uh, in the short, medium and long term? And I'll try and leave some time for questions at the end. So we are, as I said, two months after the 13th or 14th rather of uh, September. That big uh, oops, that little red diamond there, which indicated when all of the banks across Europe who wanted an exemption were supposed to have an exemption. The reality is the vast majority of banks in Europe, 6,000 odd banks, didn't make, meet that deadline. Um, certainly in the UK, the deadline is effectively, the deadline hasn't been extended, but there is a, a six month adjustment period to allow for uh, effectively live proving. Um, and to allow particularly businesses that are using um, screen scraping, credential sharing to migrate customers onto open banking. And that's kind of where we're now. We're partway through that process. We have been working on the standard now for uh, almost three years. Um, and the CMA9 and initially, the, the nine largest retail banks in the UK initially were mandated to follow the standard. They followed an early version of that with varying degrees of success. Um, but we're now very much into a phase of um, we think at least 100 banks are using the open banking standard um, in the UK and, and also in other parts of Europe. Um, and we're working through a sort of together, we're, we're more than just a standards body, we're working with banks to help through that implementation phase to help banks and fintechs um, resolve issues. And what we're seeing is adoption. So we're seeing quite a large increase in the adoption of AIS services and almost zero adoption of PIS, payment, payment initiation. So we've got about 500 firms who are kind of in our radar, who are signed up to the sort of open banking community, if you like. Um, of those, 64 are ASPSPs um, and 116 are authorized third parties. We've got over 100 technical service providers who aren't operating in the role of a third party but are providing technology and many of the firms here today uh, upstairs are, are uh, those uh, in, in, in that bucket. Um, and we've also got quite a lot of authorised third parties, sorry, third parties who are going through the authorisation process either in the UK or in Europe and, and, and passporting into the UK. And um, we're starting to see really interesting use cases coming, coming to light and I'll go through that in a minute. This chart represents the growth of API volume, API calls. Now, an API call, typically, if you're calling um, an account endpoint or a balance endpoint, there are several API calls in there. But this gives you an idea of the kind of almost exponential growth we're seeing. 
couple of caveats. This is based on data provided by the CMA9, so it doesn't, you know, it, it, it is self-attested data from the CMA9. Um, we think it's reasonably accurate for the CMA9. It doesn't represent other ASPSPs, other banks who are coming into the ecosystem, but the CMA9 is probably 90% of the API traffic, we, we think. <clears throat> but what you're seeing is a growth from almost nothing a year and a bit ago, a year and a half ago, to about 140 million API calls last month, or the month before, actually, in September. Um, and what's now driving this incremental growth is the accounts, account cloud accounting packages starting to migrate their customers over. So what we expect to see for AIS is that this incremental growth, so this exponential growth rather, will continue for a period of time, certainly over the next three to six months until the majority of business accounting packages are, are using open banking APIs. What we think will happen then is that that, that volume will tail off and what we are hoping will happen is that payments will start to come into the equation. Just to give you an idea, I think of that 140 million, probably something like 50 or less than 100,000 of that was actually payments, and most of that was probably testing. So I'm going to show you some warts and all now. This is September data, again, provided by the CMA9. This is freely available on the Open Banking website, but this shows you um, API availability. Sorry. The next one is by, by Rand. What, what this shows you is across all of the CMA9 API availability. Now, if you think of this in terms of what a good API looks like, it's not great, right? It's getting better. We're getting towards, you know, 99%. That might be okay for account information where you can cache data, either the <laughs> ASPSP or a TPP who's providing an account information service can cache data. The end customer might not be that badly affected it's nowhere near good enough for payments. For payments, you want 100%. But it's getting better. If we look by CMA9 brand, you can see some of the CMA9 are getting 100%, and some of them are considerably off that. Now, the reason behind that, we believe, is because the banks are gradually, so quite frequently introducing changes to either fix issues, and we have been updating the standard fairly frequently as well, and they're implementing new versions of the standard. Um, and many of the banks are not able to implement change or introduce change um, in, a, in, a, in a sort of live environment without taking various components of their architecture down. So that affects availability. When we look at response times, it's, a, I think, a better picture. What you're seeing um, is the average response time was pretty terrible for a high-performing API in June last year, you know, over two and a half seconds. It's getting a lot better. It's getting to under a second on average. This is at average across the CMA9 again. And if we look by brand, you'll see this is a very interesting picture. What you'll see is that um, there is an order of magnitude difference between the best performing and the worst performing. For those of you who are not technical, low is better, yeah? Um, <laughs> sorry, I, 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 I did see that almost all of you are technical, so I just, I just thought of I'm giving a presentation later on today where I'm having to explain what an API is, and it's going to be quite painful. Um, so, the, the, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the point here is that you're seeing some very large brands who are achieving uh, response times in you know, close to a couple of hundred milliseconds on average across their APIs, which is pretty good for large financial institutions. Interestingly, the cloud mobile-only um, challenger banks um, are... are probably an order of magnitude better than that there, you know, 10 to 20 milliseconds API response time. But you know, if you think about a large brand with lots of complex um, back-end uh, systems, actually this is not a bad picture, and as, a, as the previous picture showed, it's getting better. Now my, my hot topic here, conformance. We, we have um, two types of conformance and certification uh, testing and processes that we run. Just, just for those of you who are not, not aware, what we do is OBIE. We've partnered with the um, OpenID Foundation. So the OpenID Foundation um, have uh, we, we've code co-created with them uh, something called the FAPI profile, um, and uh, Open Banking now are focusing on OBIE are focusing on the functional elements of the API. So those that we what we do is we in both cases we run a very similar process where we provide open source software which can be freely 
downloaded for testing purposes, and we provide a certification process, which is self-attestation, but which we test. So these are the brands that have tested for the functional APIs with, with OBIE. Um, you can see it's a mix of CMA9, non-CMA9, small and large. Um, but that's it at the moment, at least it was uh, as of last week. So of the 64, I think, uh, uh, ASPSPs who we are aware of who are using the standard, and as I said, there's probably quite a few more, the vast majority haven't yet certified. Many of them are very close, though. Um, so we're working through this process with many of them, and there are, you know, um, small issues in many cases that still need to be resolved. Certainly, from my point of view, I'd like to see 100%. I'd like to see every bank fully certified to the standard and proving to us and to the world that they're doing it properly, and that's a, that's a really important thing. Um, we previously, up until um, last month, we were running a security profile certification. We are no longer doing that, but a number of brands there, m many of the CMA9, if not most of the CMA9, certainly certified with the profile, uh, with the security profile. But really what we want to see is people using uh, the OpenID Foundation FAPI profile and certifying that. And just a call out, please, if you are a vendor and you want to provide APIs for open banking, you need to take this seriously. You need to be get off the pot and certify with FAPI, seriously. This is not just a UK standard, it's a global standard. We are now seeing almost all of the other standards bodies across the world almost all of the markets across the world that are even starting to think about open banking, looking at FAPI as the gold standard. If you're serious and you want to provide services to banks, please follow the FAPI profile and get certified. That's my sales pitch over. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple of example authentication journeys. Now, obviously you know the, the kind of dance, the old dance where you give consent to a third party, you are then typically redirected to um, your banking, mobile, Apple website, and you authenticate and you're redirected back. And we've put a, a lot of effort in, in, uh, in the UK, certainly, to push all of the banks to uh, encourage, stroke push all of the banks to uh, use uh, app to app mobile app authentication. It's the right thing to do. The majority of personal customers use their mobile app and biometrics on their app to authenticate. That's what we think is the right thing. Interestingly, all of the regulators think that is the right thing to do now as well. And regulators across Europe are now asking all of the banks to do this. So we are in a very good, compared to the rest of Europe, I would say a very good situation with this. Most of the banks are doing this and most of them are doing it reasonably well, certainly for account information. I will show you a slightly speeded up video now. I think it's two times speed of a payment initiation. Again, this is a I mentioned payments, and I'm going to focus a little bit on payments it's, it, because account information, if, if you want to see what account information looks like, download Yolt or any one of a number of uh, personal finance managers and connect it to your bank account. You'll get an idea. I'm going to show you payments because it's not really out there yet. This is an example of a fintech called Reflow. They're a PIS uh, providing a, uh, it's kind of in, in, in test mode, but it's a, a, a real actually working demo. Uh, it shows... Uh, making an e-commerce payment via a, a Barclays account. So you choose to pay with your bank account, you choose Barclays, you are redirected, you authenticate in your Barclays app, you choose the account, you scroll down and confirm the payment and you're redirected back. Now that's a little bit speeded up, it it's, um, maybe gives a, 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 a a slightly sort of false impression, but you get the idea, right? So it, that's how payment APIs could work. Um, doesn't work for all scenarios. Wouldn't work in a point of sale. Wouldn't work in a um, uh, uh, if you were trying to authenticate on a desktop. And so what what we've worked on with again with the OpenID Foundation is the CBA client initiated back channel authentication profile, which is a decoupled profile. This allows a number of different models, and I'm going to show you an example of this now. This is an example using Ozone. This isn't speeded up. It's actually slowed down so that you can see what's going on a little bit more. So in this example, it's in a kiosk. You're selecting, for example, some coffee. You click Continue. You choose your bank. Um, this could be any one of a number of banks. It could be stored if it's a repeat purchase scenario. You choose your bank. You're presented a QR code and prompted to use your mobile banking app. 
in your mobile banking app, you choose to scan the QR code, and optionally, you could select an account. If you have more than one account, then you confirm and the payment is made. So I'm not gonna go into the technical details behind that, but there's a number of people here in the room who can uh, talk you through that if, if you wanna know more details. The point here is that this is part of the Open Banking Standard, part of the Open ID Foundation SEBA profile. It's there, it's available. No banks have yet decided or chosen to implement uh, these scenarios. And really, the reason I'm pointing this out is this is what banks have to do in terms of customer experience if you want to get payment APIs really working. Certainly, if you want to get them working to offer an alternative to cards and card schemes. There are, however, two gaps, I think. One is liability, because with cards and things like direct debits, you do have um, some degree of customer protection. Here, if you've made the payment, the money's gone. In some cases, that, that, that may create a, a liability gap for the customer if, uh, if there's, uh, uh, the merchant doesn't ship the goods, for example. But I think, really, the, the underlying reason is that um, you know, there needs to be something in it for the banks. I don't think that banks are going to introduce really slick customer experience for payments unless there's a commercial driver for them to do it. People don't do things very well if they're told to do them. They tend to do things much better if they want to do things. So I think that's a challenge that the industry needs to work out. How, you know, how, how, how does open banking work for everyone? How does it work for banks, fintechs, and customers? It can't just work for two, or two out of those three. It's got to work for all three parties for it to really work. And that's, I think, what we're seeing with payments now and probably one of the reasons why the, the, the experiences aren't that great. And also, I also mentioned previously reliability. You need pretty much 100% API availability for, for this to be a credible alternative for, for many payment scenarios. However, there is a plus point here, I think, is that open banking right now for payments could be a very good alternative to payment scenarios where you make a payment by going into your mobile app or website and entering the details manually because you can get rid of that manual entry. So anything like paying a supplier, if you're a business, paying a, a tax bill, paying a parking fine, all of those scenarios, open banking APIs, I believe, would offer a much better alternative to, to manual data entry and also reduce the cost of card collection, uh, interchange fees for, for example, government. So I'm going to show you some example use cases now, and I'm going to whiz through these very quickly just to show you what's, what's happening now. So Yolt, I mentioned this earlier. This is a, the first personal finance manager in the, that came into the UK to uh, integrate with the CMA9's so open banking APIs. Open banking makes personal finance managers better and more reliable. Obviously, there's a caveat there. You need APIs for more than just payment accounts to make personal finance really work. You need pensions, mortgages, et cetera. Uh, and that's something, a challenge for the industry, something that certainly the FCA in this country are very keen in this concept of open finance. Business accounting, I touched on this earlier. This is now where we're seeing the real growth in API traffic as the cloud accounting packages start to use open banking APIs. And APIs obviously make business accounting better. Safety net credit um, is a really interesting product from one of the fintechs. It basically monitors your accounts. You get a lending facility, and you only draw down on that lending facility when you need to, and it's all automatic, and it gets paid back automatically as well. It stops consumers getting into using unpaid overdrafts and saves them quite a lot of money. It's a very useful product. The product gets a lot better with open banking because it's more reliable, more automated, lower cost, and therefore can offer better value to customers. Financial inclusion, we're seeing quite a lot of use cases now where previously lending was based on credit score information from a credit reference agency. Um, if you add open banking to that, it provides more reliable, more accurate credit scoring that can give more access to more people to, to funding and also stop people taking funding they otherwise shouldn't have. It's that combination of credit reference agency and open banking data that I think is really powerful at the moment. E-commerce, I've touched on that earlier. I'm not going to go, go into any more detail, but this is where we're starting to see testing, but it's not there yet. And I'm just going to touch on this very briefly. CBPII, it's a new type of payment um, engine or um, instrument that was in, in, envisaged in PSD2. The first use case is just in live in testing now called Currency. It provides um, a way of connecting this card to your uh, existing account 
so that you can make international payments uh, when you're traveling, for example, at a much lower cost. It's an alternative to moving your whole account to a, uh, one of the challenger banks who already offer a lower cost or, or, or using a sort of top-up uh, e-money service. It, you, you, the key benefit here is you can keep your current account with your existing provider, and that works for a number of people. So um, lastly on use cases, um, this was announced yesterday, Nesta, uh, we've in partnership with Nesta, there's a one and a half million prize fund for fintechs and open banking. There were 107 entrants to, um, to, to this um, uh, challenge, fintechs, um, and of those, 15 were selected um, yesterday, and that was announced as finalists, and there were some really interesting use cases in there. Uh, currency actually were one of the finalists as well. So, have a look on our website or have a look on the Nesta website and you'll, you'll, you'll see that there. What's next? So there are three priorities that, that certainly we've got in, in open banking. The first is continued evolution of the standard. Um, there are things like refunds, 90-day reauthentication. By the way, just to be absolutely clear about this, there, there is a real problem with this. It's a real barrier to many use cases. Of those 107 Nesta entrants, a good number of them, their business cases don't work very well at all with the requirement to re-authenticate 90, every 90 days. It's part of PSD2, it's baked into the, 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 the kind of legislation. Um, it's a problem. We're looking at how we can provide a workaround. By the way, this is not 90-day reconsent. Please separate those two things in your mind. You will give consent to a an accounting package, for example, that consent might be with no end date because you want to carry on using it. But you have to re-authenticate every 90 days. That does not mean you have to give consent every 90 days. It's just you have to re-authenticate. Two things are different, and it's a, real, it's a real issue we're looking at. There are some things like confirmation of pay, contingent reimbursement model. These are additional things that if it's done badly by the banks, it could put additional friction that could uh, really slow down the take-up of payments initiation APIs. And variable recurring payments. Uh, too, too much to go into now, but this is something, again, we're looking at in the standard. We're also looking at working through implementation, helping the um, banks implement APIs better, and I've already touched on that around the kind of focus on conformance and certification. And lastly, but no, no means leastly, looking at the growth of the ecosystem. How can we dri help drive the growth of the ecosystem? And the reason that's important is because our reason for being is all about the CMA order, and the CMA order is all about end customer benefits. So, we need to make sure those end customer benefits that were envisaged in the order are actually delivered. So that's on our immediate radar. This is what we're working on pretty much over the next year. But there are lots of other things we could be working on or could be worked on and keep coming up. I'm not going to talk about Trustmark. It's a, it's a real Marmite subject. Identity. Banks are in a great position to provide identity services. Uh, log in with Bank X, for example, or identity attributes for onboarding with uh, KYC with other uh, sectors. Uh, non PSD2 accounts, I already mentioned that the requirement to have access to uh, other types of accounts taking you into that realm of open finance. And then obviously smart data. How, you know, how do you take this model that we've created here and, and extend it into other sectors, energy, healthcare, et cetera? But I'm going to finish with one thing. I think this is really important. I would like us to work better with the global community to create a single interoperable standard for this. It's not going to be easy because there's a lot of politics and different regulations in different markets, but that's where I think we really want to be aiming in the future. That was it for me. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. That was uh, really amazing numbers. We have time for two questions there. Two questions for, yeah, one question here will be the second one. Yes, um, the open banking standard seems to uh, whirl around payments in particular. Um, our area is regulatory compliance, uh, Dodd-Frank, uh, MIFID II, things like that, the transaction reports. Is there anything, um, any open APIs that we should be uh, open banking APIs that we should be aware of that interconnect, intersect uh, regulatory compliance. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, 
open banking is predominantly, or was certainly up until very recently, has been a compliance exercise. But it's not just about payments. There are two sides. There's the account information and payments. I was focusing on payments because I'm assuming everyone here is familiar with um, you know, the account information use cases, pulling data. But the, the data that is allowable to be pulled via an open banking API under PSD2 is somewhat limited. Um, and um, or not just allowable, but it's in scope. Um, so it doesn't necessarily touch on other regulations. Um, but yeah, I mean, we can talk offline about that. But certainly, yeah, it's not just about payments. I'm just focusing on payments because I think that's the next big opportunity. Hi, Chris. Nice talk. Uh, you mentioned about the conformance. Yeah. And why do you think it wasn't made law that the banks had to pass this properly pass these test suites or, or so? Um, so open banking, PSD2 doesn't mandate, it doesn't even talk about APIs. So there, there are only nine institutions in the whole of Europe who are mandated to follow a standard, and that's the CMA9. Uh, and effectively, the CMA9 are required to follow the standard and to prove conformance. It's part of the attestation process that the CMA9 have to go through. For everyone else, it's optional. I mean, ultimately, that's a question for the regulators. I mean, I. I, I kind of think on balance it's probably right. I mean, I wish, so I, 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 I don't think PSD2 is like full of holes from a, <laughs> it doesn't, the, the CMA order in my view is a much better regulation because it talks about end customer benefits and what, what's expected from an end customer. And I wish that regulators, it, and my ask of regulators in other markets who are looking at open banking is, the regulators should focus on defining the end customer benefits that are expected and, and, and a measurement, a metric in place of how you measure that those customer benefits are being achieved. And then I think it's up to the industry to work out conformance. And ultimately, what we're starting to see now is actually on one of those slides I showed, it's more non-CMA9 than CMA9 doing it. And the reason they're doing it is because they want to, for their own benefit, they want to make sure they've followed the standard properly so they get less complaints. So I think, you know, and also the agenda now is very much moving beyond compliance to compete. Almost every bank now is looking at how they can take their APIs and build commercial services, build it as an additional channel that they can build commercial services in partnership with fintechs mainly. And, and, and that's where it gets really interesting. So I think, I don't think it's something that's uh, necessarily a, a, a miss or a mistake. I think conformance and certification is something that will happen anyway, and it's starting to happen. Um, but, yeah, like I said, I think the regulation should really, moving forward in other markets, should focus on customer benefits. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chris. Th thank you for your talk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.